Λοιπόν, καλημέρα σας και από μένα. Θα αρχίσουμε μια ανακοίνωση από την προηγούμενη συνεδρία. Ο καθηγητής Tom Sinclair θα μας διαβάσει την ανακοίνωση του κ. Γεωγελέ, η Αρμένη της Κύπρου στις μαρτυρίες δυτικών ταξιδιωτών. Κ. Sinclair. Good morning. Of course, the content is not mine, but I have fixed the English to quite a large extent. So the English is mine. <laughs> I, I can't help uh, reading in English. I could have spoken in Greek, it's true. <laughs> Now the title is Western Travelers in Cyprus, the difficulty of locating the Armenians in Ottoman Cypriot society and its history. Our original intention was to demonstrate how the Armenian presence in Cyprus was perceived by Western travelers, as this emerges from the digitalized corpus of travelogues and monographs gathered by the Sylvia Ioana Foundation. Ideally, we would have reached conclusions as to how Armenians were identified uh, by Western travelers. Um, Um, were, in, as a question, were authors aware of the historicity of the Armenian presence in Cyprus? Did they perceive Armenians' links with Armenians elsewhere in the early diaspora? Is there a variation from author to author and according to the period when the writer made his observations? Are there narrative patterns, as far as the Armenians are concerned, which are repeated from one author to the other? I have to admit, says the author, that this agenda was ambitious, given the paucity of information about the Armenian population in Cyprus that the corpus, however generous and large, contains. In our first readings of the corpus, we perceived a palette of travelers' impressions. But it seemed that, according to their limited number, Armenians were not perceived at all by most travelers, and this remains the prevalent, though disheartening, final impression. For instance, Girolamo Dandini, who published in 1685, simply doesn't see them at all, focusing on the Maronites, while Buching publishing in 1764, simply asserts they are few and poor, and therefore cannot explain why they have a bishop and a monastery in the countryside. On the other hand, much earlier, Lusignan, probably for family reasons, knows about the connections between the island and the Cilician Armenians, and emphasizes the mobility of population, published in 1573. He posits, that Armenians followed King Guy of Lusignan to Cyprus when he lost Jerusalem to Saladin. He also knows the details of the organization of the Armenian church in general and how those residing in Cyprus are linked with the Holy See of Cilicia. Lusignan is able to locate another bishopric in Famagusta and foresees its loss in importance. This degree of knowledge is to be explained by the fact that the author can hardly be considered as a Western traveler, <coughs> but more as an insider writing in a Western language. The corpus may reveal some shifts in intercommunal relationships. Vincentio Bremler, uh, publishing in 1727, emphasizes the closeness of Armenians duly identified as Christians to the Ottoman power. They are submitted to the Turks, by whom they are, because of their good nature and customs, loved more than other peoples and needed at their surface. Armenians in Cyprus during the Ancien Regime, from the kingdom of the Lusignan dynasty to the Venetian domination, and finally to Ottoman sovereignty from 1571 onwards, experienced different phases, but 
1878, they were only 150. That's when the British took over the administration of the island. I suggest that the main characteristic of their presence in Cyprus was the Armenians' paucity, especially during the Ottoman period. Although they had had a more brilliant past, especially under the Lusignan dynasty and after the demise of the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia in 1375, which triggered off a wave of migration of Armenian refugees towards the nearby island. Armenians in Cyprus left an imprint on the island, but it almost disappeared after the Ottoman conquest, while retaining their diocese, that is, an ecclesiastical formal structure, but with almost no flock left on the island. The imprint was due to the medieval presence of Cilician Armenians, whose, whose ethnonym can be traced in the insular place names such as Armenohori, close to Limassol, or the Armenian neighborhood <coughs> around the church of Sub Asfatsatsin, i.e. the Holy Mother of God, in Nicosia proper. <coughs> the other significant imprint left by Armenians on the island is of an architectural nature, the most impressive ar artifact being the monastery of St. Macarius, which may have been founded by Copts, but was handed over to the Armenian church, presumably after the local Armenian population significantly grew because of the demise of the Armenian kingdom, <coughs> possibly in the 15th century. Both churches are in full communion. Both are pre-Chalcedonian churches. Both buildings still exist today and are located in the northern part of Cyprus. Cyprus and its local Armenian community have been a renewed topic of learned production in the 20th and 21st centuries <clears throat> because of the demographic expansion of this Armenian population following the establishment on the island of survivors of the Armenian genocide in 1915, perpetrated by the Ottoman Empire under the rule of the Committee of Union and Progress. The main book on this topic, i.e. that of the resettlement of Armenians in Cyprus, is certainly Susan Patti's Faith in History, Arme Armenians Rebuilding Community, which was published in 1996. <clears throat> the Armenian community is also extensively thematized in a collective volume entitled The Minorities of Cyprus, Development Patterns and the Identity <coughs> of the in Internal Exclusion published in 2009. The Cypriot colony enjoyed a greater fame than its modest numbers even at their peak could have justified because of the presence in Cyprus of the now closed Milkonian Educational Institute, which functioned between 1926 and 2005, which used to draw young Armenians from many neighboring regions, Lebanon, Syria, and Greece, but even more uh, remote Armenian colonies, even from France and Iran, <coughs> um, who had received there a secondary education rarely matched in Western Armenian, <coughs> po possibly in a more liberal atmosphere than at the Jemaran in Beirut. <coughs> However, the present colony is not the direct heir of the former Armenian presence from Byzantine times. Because of the limited number of Armenians in Cyprus and the different ruptures in continuity of the political regime in the island, the Armenian population always depended on regular new arrivals. Western travelers in the Eastern Mediterranean provided their places of origins with travelogues about the places they had gone to, including, of course, reports about what they had personally seen. However, their texts eventually took the, uh, generally took the previous ones into account, and one can speak of a certain degree of intertextuality between these supposedly genuine reports from the Near East. Obviously, this intertextuality and the growing practical, i.e. military and economic superiority of Western Europe favored the development, repetition, and ingraining in European culture of stereotypes stereotypes about the inhabitants of these places. The phenomenon reached its peaks 
when the Eastern Mediterranean was subjugated politically, directly or indirectly by Western Europe in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. This phenomenon is the main topic of Orientalism by Edward Said in 1978. Interestingly enough, the corpus we were offered to read about Cyprus and its inhabitants dates back to a previous period. The Western European travelers were not so blatantly in a superior position towards the local people they encountered. However, some sentences would qualify for the reproach of Orientalism, even in the period of Ancien Régime. The personal envoy of the French monarchy at the beginning of the 17th century, Louis de Zé de Courmenin, does not hesitate to describe the situation of Cyprus in this tone. The condition of Cyprus has much changed for the Turk. Sorry, has much changed for the Turks have ruined her so much according to their usual manners that there is no one among the Christian inhabitants who can afford to eat bread all year long. The balance of power is progressively changing, but the differences between the two extremities of the Mediterranean world were still comparable. After the Battle of Lepanto in October 1571, the Ottomans lost their supremacy at sea, and more than a century afterwards, the Treaty of Karlovitz in January 1699 sealed the beginning of their territorial regress in continental Europe. Cyprus <coughs> became an Ottoman possession at the point when the Ottomans ceased to be a maritime threat towards Western Europe. The island remained a part of the Ottoman Mediterranean, which was only gradually shrinking. Morocco was never conquered, Tunisia was lost in 1881, Algeria in 1830, and Egypt became autonomous in 1805, and even a competitor to the port, to the port in 1839-40. to 40. Cyprus was pretty much unaffected by these changes during the Western Ancien Regime. It was a magnet for Western travelers because of the proximity of the Holy Lands. Cyprus was a favored stopover for Christian envoys to the essential places of Christianity under Ottoman, that is, Muslim sovereignty. The content and the tone of the traveler's book, retracing their experience in the Eastern Mediterranean, dependent, sorry, dependent on the motivation of their journey to these places. Western Christians related to Cyprus as a former Christian kingdom and a Venetian possession. The island still bears obvious signs of this past. The transformation of Gothic cathedrals to mosques impressed their imaginations. Western Christians also related to the Christian Orthodox majority of the islands, of the islanders under the prism of political and doctrinal estrangement between the Western Church, which became more than one after the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, and the Orthodox Church centered on Constantinople. Um, he mentions the crisis of the Fili Filioque, 1809, sorry, 809, the official schism in 1,054 over doctrinal and territorial matters, the devastation of Constantinople in 1204 by the Fourth Crusade, and the failure of union on the eve of the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople with the acceptance by the orthodox hierarchy of the Turkish turban rather than the papal tiara, which was much later formalized as the doctrine of voluntary slavery. Thus, Western visitors had to be extremely attentive to the local human plurality in order to perceive quantitatively minor groups such as the local Armenians. Reading travelogues or narratives um, about the Armenians in Cyprus, written by travelers in Cyprus, is an unrewarding task. Whatever the convenient presentation of our corpus by the Silvia Ioannou Foundation, especially by the digitalization and the establish 
establishment of thematic indexes. There are a few exceptions among these texts, but I would dare to say that the authors concerned had a particular motivation in Armenian matters if they include, included a notice of the local Armenians. These exceptions <coughs> have, or some of them at least, already been remarked by previous researchers. This is the case with Stefano Lusignon, who lived from 1537 to 90, who was born in Nicosia, that is, was a Cypriot himself, had become a Dominican monk, and has studied under the guidance of an Armenian master called Julianos. That his work is integrated in the corpus of Western travelers' narratives about Cyprus is to be explained by the language he used in his Chorographia et Breve Historia Universale dis del Isola de Cipro, Principiando al Tempo di Noè per insino al eh, 1572 per Frater Stefano Lusignano di Cipro. That was published in 1573. He wrote in Italian and not in Greek. Uh, because of his identity as a Catholic cleric and his later move after the Ottoman conquest to Western Europe. He sojourned and worked both as a cleric and a scholar, mostly in the Italian peninsula, but also in France. He wrote his major description of Cyprus while he was living in Bologna. He belonged to the category of learned Greek speakers who came to the West in order to teach Greek letters to their newly interested Western counterparts. His existence did not go unnoticed among local and Western specialists. He's referred to by Paguran, a local learned man, who wrote a monograph entitled The Island of Cyprus in Armenian in 1903, and by Frederick Maclair, who lived from 1869 <coughs> to 1938, in his short monograph about Armenians and Cyprus, which is partly an adaptation in, into French of the previous Armenian text. Similarly to Lusignan, Richard Pocock, surprise, um, who lived from 1704 to 1765, who wrote his relevant text in 1745, was noticed by Paguran and Maclair and integrated into their text. This cleric, belonging to the Church of England, made two major journeys of observation in his life, one around Europe and the other in the Near East, which constitute a double grand tour. Though certainly attentive to the diverse forms of Christianity which he encountered, Pocock did not have much to say about Armenians. Although he registered their presence, the remarks he included in the second volume of his work, a description of the East and some other countries, are minimal. He too remarked the presence of a central Armenian church in Nicosia, Surpa Asfatsatsin, uh, which we can translate as Aya Theotokos, although he does not name it, and contrasts the imposing building to the small number of Armenians then in Cyprus. He perceives the ancient nature of this church, but does not elaborate on this matter. Thanks to Paguran, translated by Maclair, we know that the church was an Armenian possession previously to Ottoman rule in Cyprus, and that the building used to be a Roman Catholic one, and that the Ottoman authorities allowed them to retain the building by a ferman addressed from Constantinople to the local Bailer Bay, Muzaffer, quite to the dismay of local Greeks. Another author in our corpus, Offert Dopper, who lived from 1636 to 1689, a humanist who never left the ne Netherlands, knew better. The Armenians have also a very nice church, which was, in the time of the Franks or Latin Christians, a convent of women called the Carthusian Monastery. 
Topper represents another type in our corpus, that of the European scholar establishing a wide synthesis without traveling himself. He enjoys the reputation of being an unbiased scholar prior to the ideological twist of Orientalism. Richard Pocock underlines the destitution of Nicosia Armenians, but doesn't elaborate on this aspect further. In their text, Baguran and Maclair do not hesitate to assert that at least some Armenians in the Ottoman period of Cypriot history benefited from and associated with the Ottoman rule. Similarly to the period of the Lusignan and Venetians, Armenians participated in the defense of the capital under the Ottoman domination. And another quote, some Armenians of Cyprus have had important positions under Turkish domination, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. As a modest conclusion, I would say that this case study points out the paucity of information about the local Armenians in the vast corpus offered to our critical reading. More and more dense data could be gathered in similar texts of Western travelers going to places where Armenians were more numerous and more visible, Constantinople, Smyrna, and similar urban centers, and especially in parts of former Armenian sovereign states, former Cilicia, and the eastern vilayets of the Ottoman Empire. Impressions of travelers usually oscillate between two poles. They may underline an alleged proximity between Western travelers with a Christian background and local Christians, but they may also integrate the Armenians in the negatively constructed category of the Oriental other, presented, for instance, as deceitful and disloyal. I would also underline that Armenian sources, if the main focus is placed on Armenian history and not the image of Armenians among Westerners, have to be integrated in any survey of Armenian themes. The Armenians' fame, or their portrayal by visiting outsiders with possibly little contact with the real Armenians, can give only a biased presentation of their history, in Cyprus or elsewhere. Locals with intimate knowledge of Armenian matters, such as Stefano Lusignano, are, of course, special cases at the fruitful intersection of both categories, insiders and outsiders. It's therefore no surprise that in the corpus, this particular text appeared the most interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.